I was on the gondola last week and had an interesting ride. A, a gentleman jumped on with me, and they don't always allow that anymore. Um, and so he jumped on the gondola with me, and he was traveling around living uh, in a tent and uh, had been here for about four or five days just enjoying the beautiful colors. And, and so uh, he had a big, huge red beard, and it was just awesome. I was in awe of his beard. <laughs> Can't grow one like that anymore. Uh, it's a little whiter. But um, we started talking, and, and uh, I said, where are you from? And he told me he travels around, he travels around. And, and then he said, well, how about you? Where are you from? And I said, well, actually, I live here. And whenever I say that, people always say, whoa, what do you do? You must be rich. You know, you're a, a millionaire. And, and uh, I'm like, yeah, well, actually, I am. No, I don't say that. I, I said, well, actually, I'm a pastor down at a little church in, uh, called the Alpine Chapel. And he goes, you're a priest? I said, I would have never guessed that, man. And uh, I said, well, <laughs> sort of, I guess, you know. <laughs> Go with God, brother. Anyway, I don't know what comes to your mind when you say the name priest or the word priest. Maybe it's a, a Old Testament figure dressed in beautiful, colorful robes, offering some type of a sacrifice or whatever. Uh, maybe that comes to your mind. Uh, of course, we read a lot about that in the Old Testament. Or maybe it's a gentle, soft-spoken, nice guy in a black robe and a white collar. Uh, I just found this picture. I thought he looked awesome. I just want to hug him. <laughs> but the truth is that the Bible tells us that anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus Christ has asked for forgiveness of their sin and invited him into their life to be the Lord, they are a priest. Did you know that? That means that I am talking to a room full of priests today, if you've done those things. You're a priest. We get this from Scripture, right? Peter was talking about it in his letter. He talked about it a couple times. I'll read these to you. He says in chapter 2, verse 5 of 1 Peter, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, you're being built to be a holy priesthood. Wow. To offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable. In chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Peter, he says, you are a, we know this one, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen? You're priests. We see this idea in the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation a few times. Chapter 1 says, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood, and he's made us what? A kingdom of priests to his God and Father. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, you made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they're going to reign on the earth. You are a priest, even as much or more so than I am a priest. You are a kingdom of priests. And maybe that sounds a little bit strange. Maybe it sounds a little bit scary, but the truth is it, it, it's not. It shouldn't be. The truth is that you and I today get to enjoy the really good parts of what we see in the Old Testament that the priests got to do and enjoy. See, in the Old Testament, we know that, you know, Abraham had a kid named Isaac, and Isaac had a kid named Jacob, and Jacob wrestled with God underneath a tree one night next to a ladder, and God changed his name to what? Israel, right. It means people kind of argue with what Israel, the actual Hebrew word means, but, but one of the definitions is governed by Yah or governed by God. So Jacob became somebody who was wrestling and a kind of a backstabbing dude came and became somebody who was now governed by the Lord. And Israel was his chosen people. They were the ones who were supposed to be governed by God. They weren't supposed to need a king because they had him. And Jacob or Israel now had a bunch of children, a bunch of boys. And 12 of them sort of split off and became tribes. We know this, right? Maybe you don't. But one of those tribes, uh, one of his boys was named Levi. He was the one always wearing jeans. And Levi, his tribe, <laughs> his tribe uh, were called the Levites. And God specifically chose the Levites to be those that would represent him to the people. They would be the priests. And so they had a lot of jobs. 
And, uh, you know, one of their jobs was to, as the people would sin, as obviously they would do, they would bring animal sacrifices to uh, their priest, and the priest would slaughter those and offer them to the Lord, and the high priest would take a collection of all the blood from all the slaughtered animals and bring it into uh, the tabernacle, into the holy place, and then beyond the curtain to the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he would offer that one day a year on Yom Kippur, they, it is called today. But it was very interesting when you look at that, the only one tribe out of the 12 could do that. And actually, the truth is, is there was many, many people in the tribe of Levi, and you had to be selected to serve in a special way to the Lord. So not every single Levite got to do that. You had to be selected. And then from all of those people that were selected, only the high priest was the one that could go into the Holy of Holies and pre, you know, present the, the offering to the Lord, actually be in that place where it was said the manifest presence of God or the Shekinah glory of God was in that room. Only one dude on one day a year. So I say it's really cool that we get to be priests today because we don't have to do it just on Yom Kippur. You and I can bust into the presence of the Lord any day of the year on a Tuesday. <laughs> what? We can worship and adore him and we can boldly enter into his presence. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 16, verse five, therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy. How many of you need to receive mercy and find grace every once in a while? Like, I don't know, every 10 minutes for me? In our time of need. Listen, man, we today, as a kingdom of priests, we get to go in. The veil has been ripped. It's no longer there. And the presence, the Shekinah, presence of God, the glory of God gets to be everywhere, I believe. And all we got to do is enter in. And we can do that boldly. See, all of everything that I'm describing right now, this is what Christians, part of what Christians call the good news. Like, it's not bummer news. It's good news. Although sometimes you look at Christians and they're just like, whatever. Dude, you, as lame as you are and as weak as I am, we get to boldly go into the presence of God. Do you understand? There is nothing that you and I have done to deserve such an incredible thing except that he gave his one and only son, the lamb of God, shed his blood so that I could boldly go in. I love that. And we're a kingdom of priests. I think the biggest job of a priest is to properly represent God to the people in the world. Now, the priest had a lot of jobs, but I'm telling you, I think the most important job might just be to properly represent the Lord to the people. And that is our job as well, amen? You and I must be those that represent God to this world. Paul calls us ambassadors, You know what an ambassador is? Someone who takes a message somewhere. We are to be those who properly represent God to the world. And it's a huge responsibility. It's more than just getting a ticket, getting it punched and going to heaven one day. It's a responsibility of the priest to represent God properly to the world. And this is why when we hear of Christians who fall, in sin, especially leaders or pastors or, or priests or bishops or some of the horrific things that we read about in the paper that's going on. When we hear those things, they grieve a Christian's heart. Not just because we, we grieve for that particular guy or for maybe his spouse or his children or the church he led or, or whatever. We grieve because we understand the, the place of influence that he held in the world and we know that the world is looking at him and they see that kind of a fall in sin and the world is beginning to look at the church and look at Christians and say, no thanks, no thanks. Ah, those guys, I knew they were all fake. I knew that, you see what I'm saying? Humongous responsibility for those that are priests. And, and guess what? You and I, we are a kingdom of priests, amen? So it's a wonderful thing to be a priest, but it's also a little bit scary because of the responsibility that's there. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, again, just another book probably a lot of you were reading this morning. But Leviticus chapter, uh, well, I'll just tell you this. In Leviticus, we see God making a way 
for people who had flaws, who had sin, to be able to go back into God's presence. So Leviticus seems kind of boring to us because we have Jesus now and he became the once and for all time sacrifice. But before that, they needed to know what kind of animal to bring and how to do it and because they wanted so desperately to get the sin out and be with the Lord. Amen? Be in his presence. So Leviticus is all about that. And when you read it like that, it makes a little bit more sense. But what's really interesting is in chapter four of Leviticus, you see that God made provision for the priest who sinned. Well, wait, 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 I mean, priest can sin? Uh, yeah. We can sin, but here's the deal. The, the, the man or the woman who is in a leadership position and falls in sin. The Bible talks about not many of you should really presume to be teachers because you're going to be held to another standard. This is my interpretation. You're going to be held to a higher standard. Well, what does that mean? It just means that when you are in that type of a leadership position and you have that type of responsibility, it is a huge responsibility. So, but apparently priests sinned then too. And so God made provision even for them so that they could still stand in behalf of the people. Does that make sense? Let me tell you what, God, as as we know that we're a royal nation, a holy priesthood, we're we're chosen by God, all of that was we know that, but we know that we're full of flaws. We begin to understand that God's provided for us. Why? So that we can go back and represent him to the people. Does that make sense? So in Leviticus chapter four, I'm gonna read you what can be sort of a, uh, maybe a boring passage of scripture, but, but stick with me here because this is just for the priest. How does a priest get right? with God, okay? And this is what it says, starting in verse three, it says, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, he is to present to the Lord a young unblemished bull as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He's to bring the bull to the entrance uh, to the tent of meeting uh, before the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head and slaughter it before the Lord. The anointed priest will then take some of the bull's blood and bring it into the tent of meeting. The priest is to dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. Verse seven, the priest is to apply some of the blood to the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that is before the Lord in the tent of meeting. He must pour out the rest and it goes on and on and on. All right, now stick with me here. I know that's really weird and and tough, but, but stick with me here. Again, I think one of the most important mandates for a priest is to properly represent God to this world, okay? But when we are, we who are called to be priests, we who are called to be the ambassadors for Jesus to this world, how can we properly represent God to the world when we ourselves are so full of flaws? I wanna make it real simple today and I'm just gonna give you three things that I think we can do. Okay, as Christians, but as leaders, as priests who want to represent our God and bring him glory with our lives, okay? And the first thing is this. We gotta grab the bull. We must grab the bull. (laughs) If you notice here in our text in verse four, it says this, that the priest would have to lay his hand on the bull's head and slaughter it. Very interesting. By the way, let me just say this. And when you read Leviticus, you begin to see that there's all kinds of animals that were accepted, lambs and rams and birds and uh, things like that. Um, But not for a priest. For a priest, it had to be a bull. You say, well, who cares, Michael? Bulls were very expensive. They were the most expensive animal that you could bring that could be brought for sacrifice. Again, it speaks of the responsibility that the priest had. He had to bring the most expensive thing. I love, I love, I love, I've said this before, but I love how God allowed for birds to be brought by poor people that couldn't afford a lamb. God's like, it's okay, I still want your sins forgiven. Just buy a couple birds, they cost like a penny. I love that about the Lord. Don't you? Well, I can't really afford it, but I want my sin. That's fine, a couple birds. But for a priest, it was a bull. Very, very deal. And he had to lay his hand on it. Why would he have to lay his hand on it? Here's why, gang. It's very, very important. Because as the priest, and he would have the the leader of the homes do this too when they wanted their, their sins forgiven. But as the priest put his hand on the bull and sliced its throat, okay, you could feel with your hand on it, you could feel the life draining out of the animal. Does that make sense? 
I believe God had them put their hand on it because he wanted them to recognize and realize how important this was. Don't take it for granted. This is a precious price that is being the blood being shed here for your sin, buddy. As you stand up and you represent God to the people, you need to remember how precious this is. And so too for you and I. We must be people. I don't care if you've grown up in church all your life. I have too. And I know we've taken communion a thousand times. And I know it can seem very ritualistic. May it never be a ritual for those that love Jesus. May we put our hand on the bull, grab the bull, and recognize for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. I know you've heard it a thousand times, but think about it. He gave his only son. Why would anybody do that? Because he's desperately in love with you and I. And he wants us to be close to him. So he gave the life of his son. Jesus hung on the cross, and one of the seven things that he yelled out was this in Hebrew, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Literally, the sky turned black. I believe God the Father turned his back on his son for the first time ever because Jesus had taken the sins of the world. You understand, his heart was broken which is why water and blood flowed when the strong-armed soldier stuck a spear into his side. God loved you and I so much. And sometimes we've heard the story so often that we take it for granted. Man, we gotta grab the bull. How do we properly represent God to the world? We must be people that constantly remind ourselves of the preciousness of the price that was paid from my mistake. You know, it's easy to talk about somebody like Hitler being in hell. Yeah, that guy deserves it. Didn't know how to shave right. Stupid little mustache. (laughs) He was awful. Six million Jews were murdered under his regime. That guy deserves hell. Do you know you deserve a spot right next to hell, just like Hitler? Oh, I'm not that bad. Come on, I'm not that bad. I haven't really done it. No, 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 no. Your sin, the wages of your sin, Romans 6, 23, is death. And you and I, me most, deserve to be right there next to Hitler in hell. But by the grace of God, I don't have to be. I get to be in the presence of the master forever. This is grace. This is undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor that may we never take for granted. Remember the song? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a loser like me. <laughs> right? Man, it can never get old to us. Guy. When we truly understand that God has poured out the blood of his only son that you and I might experience his presence. Man, will never be the same and we will be changed and we will be better ambassadors to this world. We'll be better priests. So you gotta grab the bull, I love that. When you meet a Christian who doesn't give a rip about communion, who doesn't think about this, it's just the old story, I'm telling you, they have no effect in the world. They just don't. It's those that are broken and humble and understand it's by God's grace that I can even be here today. Man, those are the ones that can have the biggest impact. The second thing we got to do is we got to go by the horns, okay? Now, follow me here. Verse 7 of Leviticus 4 says this, the priest is to apply some of the blood to the horns of the altar of fragrant incense. That's before the Lord in the tent of meeting. So the priest, to be forgiven, had to do this thing. He had to slaughter the bull, put his hand on it. Then he had to go into the tent of meeting, and he had to sprinkle blood specifically on the horn. What in the world does that mean? Like, that's funky. We don't talk like this anymore. What is going down here? Well, in that tent of meeting called the tabernacle, when, tabernacle, when there was different pieces of furniture, and they all had different meanings and symbols, and you did different things there. One of them was this altar of incense, okay? Okay. Um, and the, the priest would go in, and he would light incense on this particular thing, okay? So I believe I have a picture. There it is. So um, I drew that myself this morning. I wanted you guys to see 
uh, with some watercolor. No, I'm kidding. So he would go in there and like this thing. Now, if you remember Luke chapter one, those of you that have been here for a while, we went through the book of Luke. But in Luke chapter one, John the Baptist's dad got picked and he was, uh, he was able to serve in the, in the uh, temple. And he went in and the Bible tells us that the angel Gabriel visited him and told him, you're gonna have a son, you're gonna name him John. And the Bible tells us exactly what his father Zacharias was doing at the time. He was lighting incense. Well, who cares? What does that mean? It, the incense was the place, listen, it was the place of prayer and it was the place of worship. It was right there on this side of that big, huge curtain and you, the high priest on Yom Kippur would go in there and, and where the Ark of the Covenant was, but all these other priests, as they went in, they would light the incense and they would, incense and they would pray and they would worship the Lord, okay? And now this particular little altar thing had four horns on the corners of it, okay? Someone's rebuilt it and they covered it with gold and this is sort of what they believe it might have looked like. You can see there maybe that there's blood on the tip there. He was told to sprinkle it and to touch those horns with um, the blood. He had to go by the horns, if I can say that. I believe that this speaks, gang, that we need that blood of Jesus, again, to go into his presence. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, according to the law, almost everything's purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or there's no forgiveness of sin. So we know this. But here's the deal. The only way the priest could go and begin to worship and adore and lift up the name of God, the only way he could do that was by the blood of the lamb. He had to put the b- blood there. Does that make sense? The same goes for you and I, gang. We want to be priests that have an effect on this world and really make an impact on the world. I'm telling you, you got you to grab the bull. You got to remember what God's done and, and bring uh, respect to that and worth to that for sure. But secondly, you and I got to be people who worship, man. You and I got to be people who pray. It's so easy to come to church and listen to some dude talk and then go home. God wants you to be a participant in this thing. The altar of incense speaks of the place where the blood now has been shed and now I can worship, now I can commune, now I can fellowship and now I can converse with the Lord. It happens right there. And if you and I wanna be people that really have an impact on anybody and do the one thing that is most important for a priest to do and that is impact people for the Lord, for his glory. Dude, you gotta be praying. You gotta be worshiping. You got to be worshiping. It's so strange. I I came from a church uh, from a denomination that's called Calvary Chapel, and in a lot of Calvary Chapel churches, they're very stoic in their worship experience. So they're just you know I've been to some that are not, but but many of them are just very very stoic in their worship experiences. Um, and then God put me in this church in. Kansas City for 18 years, and then I went to Colorado Springs and to a Calvary Chapel there, and it was 50% African American and 50% uh, Caucasian and 50% Hispanic. And so (laughs) what I realized is that, man, they got down when they, I mean, like, it was on. And when they sang, they didn't just sing songs and sing the word. They were like, whoa, and clapping, and people, like, moving around. I was like, what is happening? This is incredible, you know? Everybody shows emotion differently and everybody can worship differently. I don't think that's the only way to worship. But I do think that sometimes though our outward expression, it, 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 it reveals what's going down in our heart. Sometimes. So, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but let me just say this. I remember one time being in church and I was playing lead worship and I'm banging. I always close my eyes because uh, I'm scared of people. But I, I, would, I would bang on the guitar and I remember I looked up and there was a guy and he was just standing like this, Warren. And he just stood there and he wasn't even singing. And I thought, man, that dude doesn't even love Jesus. I just can't believe it, man. So I put my guitar down and I preached and after church, I went to the door and was shaking everybody's hand and here comes Warren. He's got a tear going down his face. He said, Michael, Worship today was so powerful. I was like, why don't you let your face know it? (laughs) But God kind of slapped me around that day and taught me something that, you know, people worship in different ways. So, So please hear what I'm saying here. But I do think, you know, we see in the Bible, people raised hands, people clap, people bowed down. There's all kinds of ways to express how we love and worship God. But let me just say this, forget all that and remember this, be a worshiper. 
Because when you worship, this is what happens, dude. By the way, God's not up there on his throne going, everybody worship me. (laughs) I deserve it. I'm the best. Yeah, tell me how great I am. Could you sing another song about how awesome I am? That'd be great. That's not God. God knows that when we worship, we change. I need to worship. He doesn't need to hear it. I need to do it. You with me? So, yeah, grab the bull, but go buy the horns too, which speaks of being a worshiper and speaking uh, to the Lord in that way. All right, the last thing is this. You got to grab the dove. Now, some of you are like, I thought we were going through the book of Genesis. We are. And here we go. That was all just introduction. (laughs) We are in Genesis chapter 8. And I'm going to finish this in the next 13 minutes, I promise. Genesis chapter 8. Uh, of course, we know that at this point in the story, we've been going through this now. Uh, we're talking about Noah and the ark. And God's wrath has been poured out on the world, and he's drowned out sin. He's drowned out all the animals and all the people, except for eight people and two of every kind of animal and seven of a few of the clean animals. And so they're all stuck and cooped up on this large barge, really, floating zoo. And they're, they're, they're floating around, and, and they've been there, the Bible told us, at the end of chapter 7 uh, for almost half a year. And uh, so in chapter 8, let's pick it up here. We're going to go verse by verse on Wednesday, but um, look, look at verse 5. The water continued to recede until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he sent out a raven. And it went back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. And then he sent out a dove to see whether the water on the earth's surface had gone down. But the dove found no resting place for its foot. It returned to him in the ark because water covered the surface of the whole earth. Let me stop here real quick. Um, Throughout the Bible, dove, a dove is a picture of, guess what? The Holy Spirit. Okay, and so remember when Jesus was baptized and the Bible says the spirit descended upon him as he came up out of the water like a dove, okay? A dove is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit and we'll talk about that in a second. But I just think it's interesting here that the dove, um, he, he releases the dove, okay? But it says that the dove had nowhere to land. And I was just thinking about that. I wonder if the same could be said for the Holy Spirit today. God sent out his spirit. He's dropped his spirit here. But I wonder if he finds a place to land. I wonder if he can look at this church. You know, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says that the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the earth for those he can strongly support. Dude, I don't know about you. I need strong support from the Lord. And God's looking around for people like that. Like, and I wonder if he's finding a place for his eyes to land. I wonder if he's finding a place for the spirit to land. I wonder if we as a church could be corporately a place for the spirit of God to land. I wonder if I can be a man individually where the spirit of God could land. You know, we sing a song, um, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Anybody remember that song? Right? Or uh, what's, the, what's the new one? You are welcome here, spirit, or something. I don't know. We sing stuff like that. Do we mean it? Do we mean it? Is there a place for him to land? And I love this. It goes on in verse 9, and it says this. He reached out, and he brought it into the ark to himself. I want you to notice something here. Noah reached out and grabbed the dove. Now, I hadn't seen this before, but you got to pay attention to this. I said, you got to grab the bull. You got to be by the horns. You got to grab the dove too. Noah wasn't sitting like this. Well, if the dove wants to land, it'll land. I'm here. Come on, bring it. (laughs) The Bible specifically tells us he reached out and grabbed it. He didn't fold his arms and watch. He reached out and grabbed. Very important. You know, the first animal that Noah set out was the raven, it said. The raven's a black bird that's known for eating dead carcasses. I'll bet you there was a lot of dead carcasses floating around in the water, okay? So the raven doesn't come back. 
It's out there. I think the raven, that black bird that moves back and forth, reminds me of somebody else that moves back and forth on the earth today. And you know what his name is? Satan. In the book of Job, chapter 1, we see Satan go before the Lord, and the Lord looks at him and says, where have you been? I love that. Where have you been? Satan's like, well, I've been moving around back and forth on the earth, just like the raven. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. What does that mean? Seeking whom he can devour. He was looking for people to take out. And that's a bummer, right? Like, oh, man, I hate that Satan is moving back and forth and he's roaming the earth seeking who we can devour. What a bummer. No, 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 no. The good news is at the same time he let the raven out, Noah let the dove out. And at the same time Satan's roaming, the Holy Spirit is released, gang. And we have the Spirit available to us today. He releases the dove. Again, the dove is a beautiful picture of the Spirit. Do you know that the dove, it's, it's obviously white, which speaks of purity, But I read this this week. Do you know that the dove, more than any other flying bird, has uh, it secretes more oil out of its feathers than any others to keep dirt away? Isn't that cool? I was thinking about that. When I'm full of the Spirit, I don't sin as much. It's really a difficult thing to be like right in the middle of worship or right in full of the Spirit. I'm reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, I just want to go steal something. But when I'm not in the spirit, when I'm in the flesh, man, I want to do some bad stuff that I'd get fired for. Okay? That's why we must be people that walk in the spirit. All right? But anyway, so I saw that the dove also was was one of the only animals that mates for life. It's all about love. A dove also will always vacate any kind of frenzy or fighting. Like, unlike a buzzard or a vulture or whatever, a dove sees something like that, it's out of there. That's why doves worldwide are known for peace. I think they're a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. And so Noah sees the dove. He's released it, and it's circling around, and, the, and the, Bible, the Bible says he reached out, and he grabbed the dove. He didn't say, if the dove wants to land, it'll come back. No, he reached out and grabbed it, and he brought it in. I want to read this because I think it's important. But so often... With regard to the power and the presence of the Spirit, people say, if the Holy Spirit wants to bless me, if the Holy Spirit wants to empower me, I'm open, do it. I came to church, do it, Lord. But that kind of passivity will never bring the potency of the Spirit in its greatest possible degree. Let me tell you something. You were not passive during the work of salvation. Don't be passive during the work of the Spirit. What do you mean by that? I didn't do anything to get saved. God, it's all by grace. I know, but you had to believe it. You had to accept it. Someone's like handing you the gift. You had to open the gift. You had to accept him into your life. You weren't passive about the work of salvation. Don't be passive about the work of the Spirit. Don't be like this. Reach out and say, God, I need your Spirit today. And I'm telling you, I really think people miss it here and what I'm talking about. God's looking for those who will partner with him. And rather than merely being passive and sitting back, we'll reach out and say, God, I need your spirit today. Like Noah reaching out and stretching out. You need the spirit. And maybe you say, well, well, Michael, hold on a minute. I thought I got the spirit, dude. Like Romans chapter eight, I think around verse nine, it talks about when when I got born again, when I got saved, I got the spirit inside of me. And you know what? You're absolutely right, you did. The question is not, do you have the Spirit? The question is this, does the Spirit have you? Does he have you? Do you know that Jesus taught us that human beings can have three relationships with the Holy Spirit? And I teach this in our Cornerstones class, but I'm going to say it now. It's very, very important that you get this. A little bit of teaching just for a few minutes and we're done. But a human being can have three relationships with the Spirit that Jesus taught So what are you talking about? The first relationship is this, the spirit with you. We see Jesus talking to the disciples in John chapter 14. He says about the spirit, he says, he's the spirit of truth. The world's unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and he'll be in you. See that? He's with you. This is the first relationship. And I would suggest every human being on the planet has this relationship with the Holy Spirit, the spirit with them. 
That word in the original Greek is para, okay? And that means come alongside of. I, I lived in Colorado Springs where there's 482 churches in that city. But there's also 130-something para church ministries like Focus on the Family and Compassion International and David C. Cook and Navigators. And there's 130 of them. It's like the Mecca for parachurch ministries. What does para mean? They're ministries that come alongside the church. Does that make sense? Focus on the family is not a church, but churches, they come alongside the church to help with families and marriages and things. You with me? Para means with, come alongside with. The Holy Spirit, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. So the only way you and I are here today You say, well, I just believe. No, no, no. Yeah, you believe, but it was because of the Spirit's drawing you and I. He was alongside of you. He was with you. You with me? So Jesus told the disciples, the Spirit's with you. But then he says, the second relationship, the Spirit will be in you in that same verse. He's with you now, but he will be in you. When did that happen? Well, I'm glad you asked. In John chapter 20, after Jesus raised from the dead, okay, He meets the disciples, and the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, verse 22, that he breathed on them and said, receive the Spirit. So the Spirit had been with them, but now it's the second relationship. Now the Spirit's in them. Now this, I told you everybody on the planet has the Spirit with them. And they reject the Spirit all the time. They don't don't listen to them. But those of us that have accepted the Lord, that God comes inside of us, Something called the Trinity, the Father, Son, Spirit. We get the Spirit to you, and the Spirit now comes inside of us. Very, very important, and most of us in this room probably know what I'm talking about. There's a third relationship, gang, that Jesus taught, and that is with us, in us, but also upon us. Jesus, after he breathed on them in John chapter 20, he told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He's talking to people that he's already breathed on. He's talking to people that he's already have the spirit in them, but he says, there's another relationship you really, really need. What's that, Jesus? You gotta be empowered. You gotta have the spirit come upon you. Why? He goes on to say, to be my witnesses. Remember how this all started out today? We are priests who are called to represent God to this world, to be witnesses of him in the right way. You cannot do it, gang. You can, I'm just telling you, you can't do it without the empowering of God's spirit. You got to grab the dove. You got to reach out and grab the dove, man. One last verse and we're done. Zechariah 4, verse 6. God says, this is the word of the Lord to a dude named Zerubbabel. He says, "Not come on, you know this one, man. Not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. I love that verse. God is speaking to a man who is absolutely confident in his armies, confident in his weapons and his horses and his chariots. And God's like, actually, I'm going to bring victory about, dude. Zerubbabel. I'm going to bring victory about, not by all your weapons, by all your horse. I'm going to bring victory about by, your, by, by my spirit. Listen, I don't care how much education you have or I have or how much you know, experience and books we've read and, and all, forget all of that. God's like, I need you to be reliant upon my spirit. It's not just about even preparation. It's about you being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? I think God would say the same thing to you and I today. Yes, Michael, bro, I need you to grab the bull, man. I need you to remember the preciousness of what I've done by giving you my son. That's gonna change you, just understanding that every day. I also need you to go by the horns. You need to worship and adore and lift up. You know what happens, by the way, when I adore and lift up the name of Jesus? Guess who I'm not adoring and lifting up when I'm doing that? Here's Blake Shelton. (laughs) Me! It's hard to worship self when I'm worshiping the master. So I got to grab it by the horns, man. And then I got to grab the dove. I wake up every morning saying, God, today I don't want to do it in my own strength. I need you and your spirit to empower me. Because I don't know who I'm going to run into on the gondola. I don't know who I'm going to run into at work. And I can't, I never know what to say. 
Oh, I'm not a priest. <laughs> so stupid. God, I need your spirit to say the things that you would want said because you know where that dude is or you know where that lady is and you know the brokenness she's experiencing in her marriage or whatever, God, and I don't. So I need your spirit, God, to fill me up today again and again and again. I grab the bull by the horns and I grab the dove every morning. Amen? Amen? I don't know if you guys noticed that rhymed. (laughs) Worked really hard to make that rhyme. I love you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Again, just a reminder. Today, God, we are as a people are in awe of you and what you've done for us by giving us Jesus. Lord, as the priest placed his hands on the bull's head, God, we, we in a sense, God, today recognize what Jesus has done and what a beautiful and precious gift you've given. Because he was innocent. He was perfect. And yet he died. Went through incredible heartbreak, Lord. Thank you for that today because now my sins are forgiven and I can boldly go into your presence. Father, I pray that we'd be people that that take that blood and we put it on the horns, God. We become people of prayer. We become people that talk to you often, God. When we're driving down the road, when we're hiking in the mountains, we're just conversing with you, God, like a friend. And we're lifting up your name. We're adoring you. We're worshiping you, God, so that we won't have ourselves on any kind of a throne, but we'll be worshiping and adoring and lifting up the name of Jesus. And Father, may we be people that reach out and grab the dove, God. We're we're not just passively waiting, God, but we're asking for your spirit to empower us. I just read it all throughout the Bible, God, Old Testament, New Testament, whether it was Samson picking up a jawbone and killing a thousand Philistines, Lord, the Bible says before that, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. God, every time I see throughout the Bible when the spirit shows up, somebody can do something amazing, way beyond what they could normally do and impact the kingdom. God, we wanna be people that impact the kingdom. So may the spirit of the Lord come upon us daily that we could bring you glory. And Father, we love you. Give us opportunities this week, God, to shine for you, Lord. We get it. This world needs to see you in a big time way. And, and, And we're it. We're it. We're it. So God, commit this word to you now. Go with us. I pray that you would bless these precious people. Bless them. Keep them. Cause your face, Lord, to shine on them and through them to this world this week. Be gracious to them as you always are. Lift up your countenance upon them, which means you turn your face towards us and see us right where we're at and give to us your peace, Lord, as we put our trust in you. And I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you guys, man.